I've taken six standardized exams since graduating undergraduate. Four times I took the MCAT before I finally figured it out, and then I've taken steps one and steps two in medical school. I spent a lot of time thinking about and studying for and also tutoring people for standardized exams and I wanted to share some lessons with you that I learned studying for step two this last time that I know you can apply to your MCAT studies. These are going to be big meta lessons. Some of them are going to be a lot more applicable that you can implement day one. But let's start with number one of the six. Lesson number one that I learned from studying for step two is it is only temporary. Your studying is only temporary so you better attack it. And this is something that I've thought about a lot. So whenever you're tired or you don't wanna wake up or whenever you wanna to go to bed or you just say, oh, well, you know, I've already done 80 questions today even though I said I'd do 120. Just finish it, it's only temporary and it does suck, I know where you're at, but attack it so that when you sit down to take that test, you will be proud of what you've put in and you will be confident that you know, maybe if I had another month to study, it would help, but another week wouldn't help. And that's a very good spot to be in because whenever you go to take a standardized test, I don't care how much you studied for it, you will always think, I wish I had a little bit more time to study and be prepared. But a good sweet spot is if you know that another week studying probably would not make a big difference, but another month would. That means you've put in an adequate amount of time studying for the MCAT. The second lesson I learned is something that I had hated before studying for step two, and that is that there actually is value in studying with a study buddy, but you gotta do it the right way. So part of that is with picking the correct study buddy, and part of that is with your approach for how you and your study buddy choose to study together. Um, for picking the correct study partner, I would choose somebody that's going for either as high of a score or higher score than you. Um, you both need to be going for very aggressive scores. So if you're studying with somebody, you know, Pick somebody that's truly aiming for a 515 or a 520. If you're both just going for a 500, it might be pretty difficult for you to get too much done because there's not that like your Keats Dodson amount of arousal or fear. So once you've got that correct study partner picked out, the best way for you to study is not really when you're reviewing content together. A lot of that times, you know, if you're just watching IFD videos or you are you know, just reading the Kaplan books or something like that. I mean, that's a lot of the time something you can, it's best to be done alone or, you know, just quiet in the same room separately. You can come together and you can talk about these concepts. That is helpful. But the best way to really utilize a study partner is with taking and reviewing practice questions and practice tests. So what I've done for step two, which I really, really appreciated, and I think made a huge difference in my score, is I had a study partner and every couple of days, we would meet up at the school at six and we would take a practice exam. And for the step exams, they're half links. So that would take us until like noon or one. And we'd get lunch together, watch some stupid TV or something until two. And then we would review that test from two until eight or nine whenever we would finish up. And I found out that being able to talk through questions with my buddy really made a huge difference because he would say things that I thought about on step day and I'm certain that I would say things that he thought about on step day as well. So you kind of get their voice in your mind um, and that's very helpful. But also, you know whenever you're taking questions and you're like, oh, I definitely knew that one. And you just go to click through it. Well, forcing yourself to kind of teach through it points out some flaws in your logic it also allows you to strengthen the strengths, so reinforce the strengths. So reviewing things out loud is a huge, huge component of the value in studying with a study partner. Something I highly recommend. I really think that that was helpful for my step two prep. The third thing that I learned studying for step two that I think is applicable to every single standardized exam is you've got to quit trying to outsmart the test and sometimes just work harder and study harder and study longer. I know that's not like beautiful guru advice, but that's the reality of it. Sometimes, you know, there are little tips and tricks that help you and much more so for the MCAT than for step one or two, because a lot of that is just like brute knowledge. Um, but for the MCAT, you know, there's these little tips and tricks that we teach on this channel and some of the strategies. But once you know those, you really need to quit trying to outsmart it and sometimes just learn more content. There is a time to realize I just need to learn more sciences. And for me, usually whenever I would miss a question, I would want to look for some other route about why I missed the question or some other avenue like, oh, well, 
you know, I knew that fact, but I didn't really apply it because I got distracted by X and Y. No, if I knew the science, I would have gotten the question correct. And I had to study harder and I had to study longer to learn that science. And once I decided to quit trying to outsmart the test and just committed to every single time I found a concept that I didn't know, I would actually take the time right then to learn it, not procrastinate and say, I'll learn it tomorrow. Just right then, just learn that concept. My score started shooting up because you learn more. Who'd have thought you learn more sciences, your science test score goes up. So quit trying to outsmart the test. And sometimes you just got to study harder and study longer. And that really sucks, but it's kind of what you, it's kind of what we've signed up for. You know, we're trying to be doctors and um, long hours and difficult studies is, is kind of what we've signed up for. And so, yeah, it's not sexy, but if, if you hear anything from me, it's probably this. You probably just need to study harder and study longer and your scores will thank you. Now, the fourth tip that I've learned is it's really just reinforcement for things that I've taught on this exact channel, which is that the best way to study is to have an extended period where you are reviewing content and using Anki, the flashcards app that allows you to remember these things, followed by like a dedicated, you know, three to six or eight weeks where you're just taking practice questions and reviewing them. It allows you to have like a solid foundation of knowledge as well as gives you room to practice applying those concepts. You know, you don't want to go into an NBA game if you haven't practiced scrimmages and practiced these plays and scrimmages, but you don't want to go into the scrimmages if you don't know all the correct moves and things of that nature. So you've got to learn all the concepts because that's the language of these tests, especially the MCAT. And the MCAT is just a reasoning test that is spoken in the language of sciences. So you have to learn the sciences so that you can speak the language. And then you've got to get practice reps through practice questions and practice exams so that you can actually practice this problem solving and this um, reasoning skills that they're actually and truly testing you on. So that's the best way to study. And that's tip number four. Extended content review period followed by intense study sessions. There's a million ways to do the content review. Um, you could look at our free program with the Khan Academy. That's very time consuming. You could look at our high yield program. You could also look at the high yield with the UWorld attached to it because that kind of does both of them, right? Allows you to knock out the content and allows you to have like organized question sections to go through. So that's the best way to study bar none. Um, and this study prep cycle reinforced that. The fifth lesson I learned was actually something that's kind of hard to swallow, and it's that missed questions are a good thing. Not only real test, but anytime you're taking like a UWorld section block or you're taking a practice exam or something of that nature, missed questions are a great thing because missed questions reveal a concept that you didn't know. And that's actually really, really good, right? Like. If you were thinking about it logically, even though it doesn't feel good, but if you were thinking about it logically, you would rather work 40 questions where you knew none of it than 40 questions where you knew all of it. Because if you knew all of it, it kind of is a little bit of a waste of time, right? Because you already knew all of that. But if you knew none of these concepts, then every single question taught you something that might allow you to get a question correct on the MCAT. Obviously, those are both extremes. You'll probably know about half of it, my guess, a quarter of that right and you might miss some questions you know just because the questions are tricky and wordy and weird but missed questions are a good thing don't be discouraged when you miss a question don't be discouraged when you take a practice test and it says 495 or something of that nature don't get too caught up in your three digit score because nobody's ever going to ask you what you made on a practice exam but they are going to ask you what you made on the real exam so every single missed question is a golden opportunity for you to learn something that's going to allow you to score better on the MCAT. And every question you get correct is there's something to learn in that too. You know, you got to ask yourself, why were the incorrect answer choices incorrect? And how could this question change that would make the incorrect answer choices correct? And usually the best way to do that is to figure out what the incorrect answer choices were actually getting at. So usually, you know, you'll read and you'll be like, oh, answer choice A is the correct answer. Answer choice B is incorrect because it was talking about, you know, hydrophilic molecules, whereas the question is asking for hydrophobic molecules. So you can usually speed up your review by, by figuring out and asking yourself what the 
incorrect answer choices we're actually asking for or what situation they would be correct for juxtaposed to trying to like rotate the question because sometimes that can be a bit time consuming. And the sixth and final lesson that I learned from studying for step two the first time studying for a standardized exam again is because this is temporary and because this is important and because this is difficult, whatever you need to do to succeed, just do it. I can't tell you the amount of money that I spent studying and prepping for this exam. I had hundreds, probably thousands of dollars worth of resources studying for this exam. I can't tell you the amount of hours, certainly hundreds, maybe, maybe cracked, maybe if you count the studying that I did throughout the year, definitely cracked one to 2,000 hours worth of studying. And this is important. And you can't do the rest of the stuff that you wanna do without this score. So whatever investment you need to make to get that score, just make it. That might be a financial investment. I had to buy a ton of resources to study for this exam. It's definitely certainly going to be a time investment. You know, you're committing hundreds to thousands of hours studying for this one test. You know, you've got to get that time from somewhere. And sometimes there are like some relational sacrifices and investments that you have to make. I certainly don't think you should isolate yourself during the study cycle. I'll probably make a video talking about the value of community as you're studying for an exam um, and how much value I got from things like my family and my friends throughout this process. But you do have to pull back. You do have to sit down and do the studying and put in the time. And that time has to come from somewhere. You all saw this channel if you've wondered, huh, I feel like John hasn't posted for the past month or two months. I haven't, right? Like, and this is something that's very important to me, IFD is, but I had to pull back. I had to find the time from somewhere. Um, and so it's very difficult to, to work and study and be a good partner and be a good friend and be a good child. And, you know, all these different roles that you have that you have to fulfill, it's very difficult to do them all. Sometimes that's where priorities come in and you have to prioritize things. And, you know, what I did was I was just very, very candid with the people that um, I was having to put on the back burner instead of just like gaslighting them and be like, yeah, bro, next time, next weekend, invite me out next weekend, we'll hang out. Like, no, I'm probably studying next Friday night, next Saturday morning. And so I just was very honest and candid with people and told them like, I'm very scared I'm not gonna do well on this test. I've done poorly on standardized exams before and it's, really delayed my life. I just refuse to let that happen again. And I'm very, very sorry. And I do love you. And I do want to hang out with you. And spending time with you is much more fun. But right now, I just can't. And there's a cutoff date. For me, that was like July 16th. Um, and I'm like, once I hit that, we can hang out. But until then, I have a commitment. And you'll see that that's pretty much everything in life. You know, whenever it comes to being good or excelling at anything in life, a lot of the times it's not just having one great thing about you. You know, it kind of feels like that. A lot of the times, especially in like professional or an academic sense, it's having, you know, the, the 1,000 small things done properly. And that's what makes this great product and you are the product in this scenario. And I think that that's true in a lot of aspects of life. I was fortunate enough to win um, an honor this past Tuesday. Actually, the ceremony was immediately after step two. So I was, I was like felt drunk through the whole thing. I was so tired, um, but it was the Gold Humanism Honor Society. And it is something I was very humbled to win. Um, but it's an honor you get nominated by the peers at your medical school and you're nominated on the basis of like someone that your peers believe is going to be a compassionate and a dedicated uh, physician with integ integrity and passion and hardworking, things of that nature. And at our ceremony, we had this giant banner and it said, humanism is, and we were supposed to each go and write what we thought the humanism was or what humanism meant. And for me, my answer was that humanism is the discipline to remain present in all situations. That's what just kind of struck me. And that means you need to remain present I mean, with a patient in the future, but it also means that you need to remain present right now, whenever you finish watching this video, after you like and subscribe and go buy our courses and things of that nature, you remain present in your studies. Looking forward to the future. This is something that Jim Carrey said that I saw the other day is that a lot of the times your joy gets stolen by trying to time travel through the future and worrying about what happens if I don't score well and what happens if I, I don't get into medical school and things of that nature. The irony of looking forward to the future, 
especially whenever you're fearing the future, is that the time that you've spent fearing the future actually l kind of fulfills your failure. So it's like this self-fulfilling prophecy. So remain present when you are with your peer reviewing that practice exam. Just always, always try to put in effort and try to improve every second every second counts remain present when you are finished with your studies for the day whenever you're going to go to sleep you know you don't have to worry about tomorrow tomorrow will take care of itself but whatever you're doing today excel at it and if you do that if you improve every single day and you show up every single day i have no doubt that you are going to get the score that you need on the MCAT and that you are going to be one of my colleagues. We'll be sharing a white coat. I'll be consulting you in no time because I'm going to do surgery and I intend to forget all the medicine stuff. But these are lessons that I learned from studying for the STEP exam. Uh, and I think that it applies to your MCAT studies as well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.